now for my one sheet wonder. This is a great, simple, and quick recipe that makes a delicious dinner in literally, I would say half an hour, 15 to 20 minutes cooking time, but only 10 minutes preparation. This came about from one day where I was running really late from work. I hadn't gone to the market and I'm home and I have to make dinner and people will be waiting. They're going to be asking me, I'm hungry. When is dinner, etc. I opened the refrigerator door and I looked in what I had. What did I have? Luckily I had pork chops and who doesn't love a delicious pork chop? And so I looked and I thought, what can I do quickly? Should I fry them? What can I do? I need to get a, you know, a vegetable. And I, I was like, that's a potato or rice or something. So I thought, hmm, what if I put everything on one sheet? And that's why I call it a one sheet wonder. It's one baking sheet, everything. And then I have something special to make it a little bit more French at the end and a little bit more a very simple way to add some elegance by doing a compound butter which i'm going to show you how easy that is to do um you can pay a fortune in the grocery store for already prepared compound butters when you can do it at home all you really need to do is let your butter out on the counter that you're going to use to get soft and you're going to get a, a compound butter so what i have here is i have four pork chops and I've already prepared. Um, I'm gonna show you one in the process. And to continue our French theme, I am using Herbe de Provence, which is one of my favorite herb combinations. Herbe de Provence is a combination of a lot of the herbs in the region of Provence, which is in um, southeastern France. And I, I've been there twice and I just, I can't wait to go back and the field smell of lavender, rosemary, thyme. And so what they do, and you, you can buy this in the store already prepared, and that's what I've done. I found a good quality one. One thing to read for, for a really good Herbe de Provence is if they include lavender. It isn't really truly Herbe de Provence without the lavender. There is rosemary, thyme, um, usually a little bit of sage, some dried garlic, just a hint. It, it, you would not find it to be overly garlicky. Um, but believe it or not, that little tiny hint of lavender makes a difference. And I'm going to have, I have some beautiful lavender in the rose garden that right now it's winter, but when it comes alive again and we cut it, I'm going to show you how to cook with it. You use it sparingly because lavender can be very powerful in cooking. And so a good herbe de Provence has a little bit of lavender. So read the ingredients on the bottle. You certainly can make your own herbs de Provence. Um, and this was quick and easy. I opened the refrigerator and I opened my cabinet to see what was there and what I could do. So I have four pork chops that are roughly, I would say just under an inch in thickness. There's two pounds here. So each pork chop, I would say, is um, a quarter, uh, is a half a pound. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, a half a pound. That's correct. And what you do is, the first thing you do, what I have done. A lot of people are like, well, when I cook with pork, I get this white stuff that comes out of the sides and in places. Well, how to avoid that? Wash your meat. When you bring it home, right before you cook it, put it under cold water and then dry each piece with the paper towel that you will discard. I have them on a paper towel because I wash them. And that will get rid of that. What that is is a byproduct of the fat that's contained in the pork chop. It's one of the things that makes any, whether it's a pork roast or pork chop or a crown roasted pork, it's the fat, of course, that it makes it very delicious. But you have to, if you want the unseemliness of it, just wash it. You still will get the wonderful flavor. There's enough fat elsewhere that it's gonna be completely fine. So what I'm gonna do right now is a good amount, I would say season each pork chop with a sprinkle of salt on each side. Pepper, I only use fresh ground pepper. If you don't, that's fine. But if you try it for a change, you're gonna find a real difference. It's really good. And Herbe de Provence. And I'm using it right out of the can. And we're going to just simply turn it over. My hands are scrupulously clean. I 
again, salt, pepper, and de Provence, simple. Then, luckily I had breadcrumbs. I actually always make sure I have breadcrumbs in my um, pantry because if you're gonna cook something at a high temperature quickly, and I'm not quite broiling this. This is pork, you can broil it, it'll come out fine. But in this particular dish, it's I'm putting it on the middle rack of my aga, which would probably be not the broiling rack in a normal oven, but one down, essentially, it would be in the middle of your oven. You want your oven to be at about 375 to really do this in 20 minutes. Um, so, we coat the pork chop in breadcrumbs, and that's it. And it's ready to go. The next thing to do is, and I'm actually going to measure it because I've always just done this, olive oil, and I do use, for all of my cooking, extra virgin first cold press olive oil. Now, what's important to note about this, when you're using extra virgin cold press, if you're frying anything at an extremely high temperature, you can't because it has a greater likelihood of flaming. So you use a medium grade or lower grade of olive oil if you're gonna fry with it. And what I mean is mainly deep fry, because I will say, if you use extra virgin, not first cold press, to do French fries or pommes frites, they're gonna be the best French fries you've ever had in your life. I promise you, but you have to be careful. You can't let the temperature get too high or the oil will flame. In this case, because it's baking, it's not so much of a, an issue. And, um, you know, I do prefer the flavor. It really is a significant difference in flavor. But any grade of olive oil for this particular recipe, recipe will do. And so I'm measuring out, we have one tablespoon, two, still not enough, three, so it is. I wasn't sure, and so I did it for you right now. It is four tablespoons of oil, which is really a good way to remember this recipe when you go to do it. It's a one sheet wonder, but we have four, four, and four. So, um, you know, just spread the olive oil all over your baking sheet. Use a non-stick baking sheet, of course, for this. Um, it's going to make your life a lot easier, and especially if the whole point of this is that it's quick and simple, you do want it, you don't want to have to worry about things sticking to it. So what I do very simply is each pork chop is put on. If you have some, I get them with the bone. I feel there's far more flavor. I know you can get easily trimmed pork chops that are beautiful, have no bone, they're in beautiful ovals or medallions. Well, the bone has a ton of flavor and I like it. And so that's what I'm using. And so the ones with the bigger bone, it they are going toward the side of my aga because the way the aga works, the heat comes from the interior and it goes to the right. And so things brown quicker and cook quicker a little bit on the left side because the heat is going toward the right. So the left side of what you're cooking is going to get the heat first. So those of you who have an aga, you need to be aware of that because you'll see in certain recipes, I pull things out. If I want to brown a chicken, if I want to do pastry or something and it has to be evenly browned, I turn it halfway through to make sure it's evenly browned on either side. And then the ones, this only has a small piece of bone. I'm a little disappointed about it, but that's what the butcher did and the other one, okay? Then what I do is, for the pork chops, the next most important thing is you can omit this if you keep an eye on your pork. The pork should be cooked to 145 degrees for medium to medium well. I would say medium at 145, but check it with the meat thermometer if you've never done this before. That literally is what the USDA says pork is done to at medium and that it's safe to eat 145. These days, we really haven't seen a lot of problems with pork. So you can go medium, medium, slightly medium rare. Most people do like their pork only medium 
and then going the other direction toward well, especially in the United States. So I'm putting a tablespoon. You can omit this. I'm doing this be to make sure my pork chops are nice and moist and juicy. I put a tablespoon of butter on each pork chop. Um, it simply, it will still brown, they'll still be beautiful, but it bastes it while it's in the higher oven because technically the aga in the what is called the roasting oven, the highest temperature is 450 and it's at a constant 450, that's the upper part, the lower part drops to 400. I'm recommending at home in a normal oven 375 and check it. And I'm recommending for this whole dish, 20 minutes max, check it at 15 with a meat thermometer. Okay, because if you don't want it too overdone, just check it at 15 minutes. It, it is that quick. Okay, so the next thing we do, we have this wonderful olive oil everywhere. We're gonna tilt the pan, make sure the olive oil gets to where you need it. You don't need tons of it everywhere. So what I've done is I've pre-cut broccoli florets. Asparagus works great with this as well. Uh, but if you use asparagus, you want the thicker asparagus. And I usually do what is called French them, where I shave the bottom. After I snap them, I do shave the bottom because you get more of the asparagus and you, you get to use more of the stock. Because what's gonna happen is the asparagus, you, if you use the very thin, tiny asparagus, which I do like for other recipes, in this, they're gonna shrivel up to nothing. We're roasting this and roast broccoli is absolutely delicious. If you have children or someone who doesn't like broccoli, try this. See if they like it because it's a very, it's a beautiful flavor. It is very different and I, I cannot recommend it enough. But I take each florette of the broccoli that I've already cleaned, washed, cut, and prepared, and I put it in the oil and I really get it around coat it with the olive oil and every single one we're going to do that too and I need to tilt it so my oil is going to come forward it's all sitting at the top you don't want that and so every single one we're going to do this too and I just I wouldn't use green beans unless you were desperate they will work and I and I would say not French, when you see them in the grocery store, they're more French, the um, haricot vert, junk. They will show up to nothing um, at, the, at these temperatures. So really, Brussels sprouts, I do recommend if you parboil them for about three minutes first, because otherwise they're not gonna get enough cooking time. And a good little trick to parboil things is the microwave. Put them in water, put them in the microwave, Three minutes, parboiled, you don't need an extra pan, you do it in the bowl, you're done, easy cleanup. You know, it's amazing what a lot of the modern technology has done. And I have adapted some of the wonderful, we've been talking so much about Louis Viat, Julia Child, the wonderful LaRousse Dictionary to French Cookery. And LaRousse, you can get more up to date. Mine is old, it's, oh, it doesn't predate the microwave, but <laughs> I remember when my mother first got one, she thought it was for two things, making bacon on a little tray <laughs> and popcorn. Because her and my grandmother, of course, they did everything by hand. They did not, these things, they, of course, like the food processor was a huge deal. And then they still wound up not using it. My mother would say, well, I'm good with a knife. I know how to cut. And also, you know what? I'm gonna add a little more olive oil. So if you need to, you ha might have to go to five tablespoons of olive oil. It really depends upon the broccoli because when I was talking about my four and four, four pork chops, four cups of broccoli uncooked, you know, cleaned, washed and rinsed, ready to go. And then four cups of small potatoes and I was not able to find my favorite. You really rub them in the oil. That's what's going to give the broccoli its really good flavor and a beautiful brown texture to it. It'll look roasted and it will taste just wonderful. So the potatoes, 
There's one store and it's about 45 minutes from me. And I put the broccoli a little toward the front. In an aga, this will not work in your other oven. When you get really good at using an aga, you realize what the aga does well. And because the heat is concentrated and it moves from left to right and back to front, the back portion when you're roasting in the ovens is much, it's quite, it's, it's a good deal hotter. And so what I do is the vegetables here, the green vegetable, I don't want them ruined. And so they're toward the front. The meat, which is gonna need the absolute most time is toward the back, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do with the broccoli, all I do is season the broccoli with pinches of salt. So I'm taking it with not even a teaspoon of salt. I would say half a teaspoon. What's in my fingers, that's it. Now, I take little tiny potatoes, and what I was talking about, the grocery store does the tiny potatoes. And I love them because they're exactly what Louis Diot in his cookbook talks about. What was the first potato um, he got in his parents' house and his grandma lived with him, and she particularly loved them. And he, and he writes about this. And the, the pomme de terre de noisette, very tiny, tiny, tiny. And they're really, they're wonderful. These are a little bit bigger if you can see them, okay? So what I've done is you're, I did parboil them for two minutes in room temperature water in the microwave. If you want to be very authentic and truly parboil something, you do do it on the stove. Um, that would be the classical technique. And so then all I do is I pile the potatoes on and they're going in between. And what's great is the juices that are going to come out of the pork chop are going to flavor your potatoes. Like this is like the best thing I think I ever came up with. I mean, really, <laughs> I can't believe something so delicious and so simple is these few steps. And for flavoring, so everything doesn't taste the same. The potatoes, I absolutely, and forgive me, here's where the quickness comes in, parsley, and I'm using dried. For the compound butter, I'll show you, I'm not using dried herbs. There's nothing wrong with using dried herbs. You just need to know that a dry herb is a little bit more concentrated than fresh. You're gonna use far more fresh herbs than you are gonna be dried. The, the flavor is concentrated. And then I'm gonna use a little oregano on the, on the potatoes. I feel a little, slightly Italian, so a little oregano. Um, otherwise, what's great is uh, rosemary. Rosemary and olive oil on potatoes is just phenomenal. What I do when I use the rosemary though, when it's dry, I put it in my palm and I just simply, I crush it with my fingers and then I sprinkle it. So it releases, it does release some of the oils. There's essential oils even in the dried herbs that can come out when there's something a little more firmer like rosemary. I, I haven't really, I don't think with parsley, sage, or thyme, that's going to really be appropriate, or even really, I, I think, just use it the way it is. But rosemary, it is a really good thing to crush it in your hand. So all we do now is it's going to go in the aga. It's going to go in for 20 minutes, and it's going to be done. And you just let it sit in there. And that's why I have the butter. It's basting itself in the butter, okay? If you omit it, if you omit the butter, take a look at it, okay? just take a look at it and then if you first time use a meat thermometer just to check that it's 145 fahrenheit um but if, if you're using really good organic pork from a farm you you know you you can you know decide to do what you would like so i just stick it in the oven and that's it literally i set the timer for 20 minutes in 20 minutes we're gonna have dinner i'm gonna pull it out and put it on the platter and we're done. For the compound butter, I wanna do that right now with you. What I've done is simply let, I would say this is four tablespoons of butter that I've just allowed to come to room temperature so I can whisk it, okay? And so now what I do is I'm gonna add, this is about a tablespoon of fresh chives. And all you do is put it in and you're gonna whisk it, it's that simple. What's great is if there are other herbs you like, if you wanna put fresh rosemary, fresh whatever, thyme, oregano, parsley, you name it, you put it in your butter, whisk it, 
and you have a compound butter. Now, there are several ways of doing it. A great way, which I is, and it will keep, I am using salted butter, by the way. You don't have to. I'm using salted. If you need, if you're using unsalted, I would, I would recommend putting in a pinch of salt just to bring out the flavor. It's going to help the herb. But if your butter is already salted, there's enough salt in this that you really don't need to do anything with. And so what I do next is I chill it so that when you put it on each pork chop, you have a nice little, like, um, I'm going to call it a canal. I don't know if you know what canals are. They will be in one of my episodes. But they're little poached pipe dumplings, and you see them in France, especially in the Lyon region. And in Lyon, I had the best canal of my life. It was at the Maison Rabelais, and Rabelais was a great French author. And his house was turned into a really good gourmet restaurant. And I ordered for, this was um, for lunch, and I ordered uh, canal gratin. And they frequently in Lyon take the canals, and it could be salmon. Pike is the most traditional, but in France, you're going to see, there was one dinner I had in France, and it was, you know, a pre-arranged dinner with friends, and they had a, they, they did the cooking, and they did it with salmon, and it was quite good. But a canal is like a little, it looks like a little madeleine, really. And so what I do is I just simply, I take two teaspoons, and I put the butter together between the teaspoon, and I just drop it. And it forms a nice little, it looks like a little madeleine. Or madeleine, sorry. And we just do that again. And we form it beautifully. And then it goes immediately into the refrigerator so that you have them and that they solidify. And then you place it on your pork chop and you've taken my one tray wonder and you've made beautiful canals. that you're gonna place on your pork chop. Just wonderful. And it's gonna add, you'll see, how elegant this dish can look. And it really was one of the most simplest things you can imagine. And I created this out of an accident. Sort of like how um, Louis Diop, you know, how he came up with Vichy Soise was a complete accident. He needed a soup. It wasn't hot. What did he do? And this is true, he writes about it in his book. He took the cold potato leek soup that was at room temperature and he added really cold cream to it and called it Vichy Sauce and served it and everybody loved it. And it became famous. So we're gonna wait another good 15 minutes and we're gonna put the platter together and it's gonna be a delicious dinner of pork chops, broccoli, and um, pomme de terre mosette with some butter canela. And now our moment for Louis Quinze. Here are two beautiful French commodes, and they're on the smallish side. I use them in my dining room on either side of the window. They just work perfectly. They are from the 18th century. And as with all Louis XV, as you can see, we have curved legs, we have the addition of foliage and bronze ormolu, and even the handles are done on a very organic theme. The marquetry is simply magnificent. It is rosewood and kingwood combined, and I don't know if you can tell, but the varnish is original. And when you have period pieces, don't touch them. People will want you to restore them and change them, and it, it can be quite costly to restore, you know, such an antique, but it's like a fine violin or string instrument. The varnish is important. Don't touch it. Just dust it. And the other recommendation is do not use any type of furniture polish. You simply dust it. If you're going to, if you feel it needs to be cleaned more deeply than dusting, then a little tiny of dish soap in some warm water, wring out the cloth, make sure it's not overly moist, and very gently go over it and then dry it with another dry cloth. One of the reasons I selected these is the marble on top is unique. 
we do not know if it's original to the commode. And the reason I chose it is I'm of Polish and Ukrainian descent and Malachite is very much a part of the history in Eastern Europe. And so it reminds me of Malachite, which is extraordinarily expensive. If this was in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, there's a famous Malachite room. Um, just a little bit of Malachite can be very costly. And so I did, as an excuse, I had to pull out those orange roses from our first episode um, on Crepe Suzette because they've opened up and I just had to share them with you. I really don't know what's better is the antiques and the painting or the roses. And so they're really quite splendid. I treasure them. I, I acquired them about when I acquired my um, this property. And <laughs> we were in restoration. We always seem to be in restoring this old stone farmhouse. And they had to wait to be placed until the dining room was finished. But the minute I saw them, I really thought of this space. And it just is a wonderful, it's the far end of my dining room. And I just love them because you can decorate them with flowers or candles for a party. Um, also, you can put um, your serving dishes off to the side or whatever when you're waiting to serve a particular course. They're just very useful. Also, the drawers in these are functional and they're very deep. And so I do fit all of a lot of table linens in them. So that is our moment for Louis Cannes or Louis XV. While we're waiting for the pork chops to come out, I thought I'd take this moment to talk about experimentation in the kitchen. That's how I came up with this dish. And I will say it's my dish. It's my one tray wonder. And remember, it's four, four, and four. Four pork chops, four cups of broccoli, four cups of small potatoes, preferably golden, or pomme de terre de noisette, if you can get the really, really tiny ones. And simple. One of my dearest friends, really, uh, Heidi, she was a, a scientist, and she always called her kitchen her laboratory. And she usually used the weekend to prepare everything she needed for the whole week so then she could go back to the laboratory. And she did a lot of great creations in that kitchen. And remember that Karan Escoffier, Diot, Julia Child, Simone Beck, and one of my favorites, Georges Perrier. There the pork chops are done and we're ready to pull them out. Um, Georges Perrier was the um, chef de cuisine and the owner of Le Becton in Philadelphia, one of my favorite restaurants of all time. Other than eating in Lyon, and I've eaten in some of the best restaurants in France and in Paris particularly, but Lyon being the true culinary heart of France, his work, his creations are par excellence. And it, it is, a, everyone used to go to Le Becton in Philadelphia. And it's very sad that it's now closed. And he's on to other wonderful things. And I, his cookbooks, I love. I have one and it's signed by him. And I, I will share that book with you. Um, he created a beautiful braided fish between sole and salmon for Grace Kelly, Princess Grace. Um, and she ate there you know, royalty ate there, um, president of the United States ate there. He was just, he is a genius and I, he is one of my great inspirations. So I will be sharing some of his recipes with you. And now we're ready to pull the pork chops out. And so this is my little one tray wonder and we're gonna look at it. And so we go down and I, Pulling it, there's the steam coming out of the roasting oven of the aga. I love my aga, as you all know. I can't live without it, and it is perfect. Everything is exactly as it should be. This is amazing. Take a look. There is nothing better than a pork chop done properly. This could not be more simple. 20 minutes, and you're done. <laughs> And can you believe it? And it's going to taste just like France. You will feel like you are in Provence and this was 20 minutes. 
30 minutes altogether with the prep time to get everything ready. So now I'm going to, I'm going to put everything on a platter and plate it for you on the platter. And I'll be pulling out my canals. I actually, because I'm doing this rather quickly today, I put them in the freezer to make sure they completely solidified. So what I like to do, I have a platter here. And the great thing about the aga is there is the wonderful warming drawer at the bottom that keeps everything warm. Because what you do want to do, you want to always, it does matter. I really do think it does matter that your plates are warm when you present the food because it's going to keep, I, there is nothing I hate more when I go to a restaurant and I get food that is tepid and my biggest pet peeve is cold mashed potatoes. It just drives me crazy. So the aga saves us from that. So what I do, I'm going to pile all these wonderful pommes de terre, not quite pommes de terre mohasset, in the middle of the platter. And this is an easy way to come up with an elegant and yet rustic garnishment. I am going to have a special on garniture, how to garnish plates beautifully and simply without a ton of work, where you can do it at home in a matter of minutes and, you know, your guests are going to think you've spent hours and hours in the kitchen. L little did they know this was 20 minutes of cooking and 10 minutes of prep and that's it. Excellence. Par excellence. You know, I tell my students to strive for intensive study. And that's part of researching these old cookbooks. It's not just about a particular recipe, a particular dish. Go back, look at everything. And then, there you can be creative. And so, over the pomme de terre, I'm putting the gorgeous pork chops. So I hope you can see this. I'm going to move a little bit so that it's more visual for you. And I hope you can see. Excellent. And so we pick them up and I'm putting them in kind of a wheel succession, which I think is really lovely. And then in between the broccoli and again like I said if you have not had roasted broccoli do it there is nothing more delicious than roasted broccoli I it's amazing you take something so simple very affordable salt pepper and a little olive oil and it is simply delicious and it is so healthy and good for you do it and if your kids complain serve them roasted broccoli they might stop their complaining I think that's one of the things, you know, you need to make the food good tasting, you know, and this really, it does highlight the aspect of what roasting food is like, what it tastes like, and what it really can do to a meal. So I'm arranging all of this, and then in a moment, I'm going to pull my canel de boue or my my canals made out of butter to place on this you know gorgeous platter and then my final garniture or garnishment is going to be so if you look at it it really is quite wonderful and splendid i'm sure anyone be, would be happy to put this on the table and can you believe 30 minutes tops from beginning to end so off i go into the freezer and my canals are perfect. Again, this was just a compound butter. I let the butter soften. It is salted butter. If you, do, if you use unsalted butter, you will need absolutely to add a little salt. And it's just chives. You can add the herbs of your choice. In this case, though, I'm going to be very specific. When dealing with a compound butter, you only want to use fresh. I feel it is very ineffective to use dried herbs in a compound butter. I like the fresh and because when the butter melts, you know, on the composition or the, you know, the meat or viand of your choice, this, you know, you, it has to be elegant to the, 
the palette. You, you want it to be very beautiful. And so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a normal butter knife. And I just lift them carefully, go around them. And, the, and all you do is you take one of your canals and you just place it on top, like so, very, very easily. And it's gonna melt over the hot pork chop. And while you're doing all this, because one, we talked about the FDA regulations, and it's not so much a regulation, it's the recommendation of what cooked pork should be. And I do recommend that you read what they say. I think they're really helpful. They say that a pork chop should be done to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I recommend using a meat thermometer until you get familiar with this recipe. And they recommend letting it rest for three to five minutes, which I agree with too, but which by the time you do all of this and you add your butter canals and you put your dish together, it has rested for three to five minutes. I drop my canal. And so, like Julia Childwood said, who's to know? Who's to know? Luckily I have enough of another one to put right on there beautifully. You're in the kitchen alone, right? You would never use something from the floor, but if you have a little extra butter, it's gonna work. And here we have my one tray wonder. Pork chops with broccoli and pommes de terre de noisette. I would like you to see the dining room for the one tray wonder. And remember, it's four, four, and four. Four pork chops, four cups of broccoli, four cups of potatoes, and I've set the table for four. What uh, my inspiration as you're learning is roses, of course. I grow roses, I love roses. It reminds me my father kept a rose garden for my mother, and it reminds me of her. And when I saw these, I had to get them because also the pink of them, again, of course, these are dyed. But the pink reminded me of one of the hardiest roses I grow, which is the Queen Elizabeth Hybrid Tea. In this region, it grows like you wouldn't believe. There, nothing can stop that rose. I've ha it has been the longest lasting rose bush, and I have four of them in my rose garden, and they're just wonderful. And they're named after a wonderful queen. They are. It was bred for Queen Elizabeth the second. And you know what? She never stopped and they don't stop either. I've chosen simplicity for this table because of course I, I was in a rush. And so I've decorated the table with artichokes because we're having an artichoke salad. And I will have an episode on how to cook artichokes. These are fresh and they are real. They're from the grocery. And what I've done is it's everything is very simple and it brings everyone's attention to the roses. Part of the inspiration is these beautiful Tiffany candlesticks. They are crystal, but it reminded me of blown glass. And so I pulled out some crystal that looks like blown glass. The wine glass on the right, actually, I got for $2 each at a local thrift store. And the one on the left is a crystal glass and it's from Williams-Sonoma and they still do carry that. These candlesticks by Tiffany, they were a gift. They were a Christmas gift. And who doesn't like opening a Tiffany box? They're actually quite heavy. And I've chosen beeswax candles because I, again, my love of nature and they give a warm feel and a slight sense of honey as you burn them. A little bit, a moment for vintage table linens. This tablecloth is a vintage moray silk tablecloth, and you can see the moray pattern in it. And also these lovely little napkins. These are Belgian linen, and again, thrift store. They were a dollar each. So we have Tiffany 
and we have things for a dollar. And look at how beautifully they work together. And I love old vintage things. If we look at this, this I picked up for a dollar fifty, and the workmanship is just gorgeous. The embroidery, and it's so wonderful to know that someone did this by hand, and they put themselves into it. It really is a work of art, and I do recommend everyone really trying to use vintage items because there is there's a lot more warmth to them. There's personality to them. Here, because of the rose and the pink roses, and that remind me of the Queen Elizabeth hybrid tea, I've chosen this Adams China from England for the salad plate. And they have been in business, if I turn it over, carefully, of course, they've been in business since 1657. And this is their Califax ware. And it is hand painted. What I've chosen for the dinner plate is the beautiful, this is Bernardo, and this is the uh, Louvre pattern. And they're just so beautiful. They go with anything. You just simply can't go wrong with them. The cutlery in the silver is the Williamsburg shawl pattern by Kirk Steve. It's just beautiful. And it, each one is marked with the Williamsburg. This was specifically made for Colonial Williamsburg. Each piece has its mark on it. It's just wonderful. And the knives are, they are pistol handles. Another thing I love are these uh, Longuil um, steak knives because we're having pork chops. We do need a steak knife. And they're just lovely. And they have these little bees on them. I thought it was fun. Preparing in this table really was a joy. And another very personal piece I used was the vase. This belonged to my mother. And if anyone wants to do some research about the Globe Store in Scranton, Pennsylvania, this was a gift from the president of the Globe Store to my mother, and it is Saint Louis Crystal. I've treasured it, and I try to use it whenever I have a really beautiful arrangement of roses because the rose reminds me of my mother and my mother's favorite color of roses was pink. So I encourage you all to please grow some wonderful Queen Elizabeth II. And they are just called Queen Elizabeth hybrid tea. If you're gonna look them up to get the uh, bare roots to grow them or if you're going to find them in a garden center, it is just Queen Elizabeth hybrid tea. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode.